It is time to ignite those dreams of our young people and empower the youth to bring their visions to life. Now we are partnering with the After School Graduate Development Center on the Ignite Enterprise Project to provide practical tools to teach young people how to build businesses and to create employment for others. In Lagos, the possibilities are endless. Lagos State, in partnership with AGDC, presents Ignite. Powered by First Bank and supported by Bank of Industry. Ignite, from dreams to reality. Dynamic pricing, uh, pricing. This strategy features the ability to quickly respond to market fluctuations and data captured from customers. We've talked about that. You can react to perception in terms of your price or to changes, political changes in the market. Keystone pricing. Keystone pricing is the practice of basically doubling the wholesale cost of the product and using that number as its retail price. When you double the wholesale cost, it, could de it depends on your source and what you're getting and how you're getting, which means that your customer must always know. It's why some people tell you this price is only valid for what? For three days, for seven days, for 10 days. If it's in a volatile industry and they know that things can change quickly and it will affect their price. And if you're not lying, because many people lie, you say, ah, it's not me, oh. Is the manufacturers that have changed, or still, the price of steel has gone up. Some products are sensitive internationally to certain globally traded products. And once there's a major change in the price globally, it directly impacts on your price. Now, sometimes the stock that you have is at a price, but your ability to replace it would mean that if you do not increase the price at which you are selling now, because of changes from your manufacturers, you will not be able to buy the same quantity. It means your capital is going down, your business. Is, so you've got to adjust the price based on realities of the market so that your business can continue at the same level. You're not taking advantage of the customer. You are readjusting, realigning your stock to the realities of the market in order for continuity of your business. So you have to know what is right, what is wrong, so you don't condemn yourself for what you should not. Do you understand what I'm saying? Those are part of the realities that are important. Limit pricing. To accomplish the objective behind limit pricing, the selling price is set very low so that any would-be competition would have to enter that market losing money per unit. I already explained that to you. Some people do that. They do it just to control the market or for a simple, or for whatever reason. So survival of business as long as you're working within legality. Never forget that. Never forget that. List pricing. Manufacturers always have recommended retail price for those of you that import. They will tell you this is how much you should sell. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Because your own environment can create a different factor that affects your price. Price discrimination. Using different prices for the same product in different applications or situation. You know, there's a company, I think it's... Um, Air or something, I don't know what their name is. They realized that in India, the rate at which they were selling their washing machine in a particular area was increasing. And they wanted to investigate to find out why. They then realized that in that particular region of the country, they grow vegetables and everything. And they had found out that their washing machine can be used as a vegetable washer. So when they pluck their vegetables and they want to wash them before they deliver them, they will load them into the washing machine and run the water through them to clean them. Now, they were struggling to apply the machine for that purpose where it was being used. So the company went back and made a slight adjustment to the design to make it easier to use for that purpose. But by making that slight adjustment, they could sell at a different price from the original washing machine. Same product, different application, slight adjustment, higher profit margin that can be commanded. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's so many different things you can play with, which is how you can separate yourself from the group, from the general market, or you can create room for you to charge a higher price. You must always be thinking. You must be proactive. When you think that a product is becoming a commodity, 
Do you know what a commodity is? When it's, it's everywhere, there's nothing different about it. You know, for our chair lines, we have certain models that we say are just they're generic chairs. Why are they generic? It means everybody has their version of it. Even though the quality of our version is much higher and is more durable and all that, the Chinese versions are all over the place and they probably sell for half of that price. So on that particular chair, imagine it's this small. So we don't sell it for profit. We sell it to block that segment of the market and we sell it as Ban Kunjo. Do you understand what Ban Kunjo is? It's a hard-on sale because the guys who will buy the higher level chairs and all that might also need some lower, lower level chairs that fit into that level. And rather than leave them open to go and find another place to look for that chair, you want to keep all their transaction. So you hold certain models that you're not really making money on them, but they add to turnover for you because their transaction, but they also hold your customer within. Uh, they allow you to control your customer's complete transaction rather than taking a part of it out. So if you might have a pricing policy that you cannot always generally apply, for some reasons, you, you will discriminate in some cases. And you're like, oh, okay, these tops, I only, I'm selling them for next to nothing. For every, that's why you enter some shops. If you buy three, they'll give you one for free. The one they're giving you for free it has no real value to them. Or after they sold the first hundred of it, they already made their money. Everything else is just excess. There are some products you produce from your scrap. After you finish the main production, all the excess scrap, you can turn it into products. With those ones, you can sell it for next to nothing. So whatever price you sell it, you're making money because it's already covered. There's, a, there's also something else you need to know. For those of you that sell products, there's some bad guys who do stuff like drugs and stuff and all of that. And when they want to take their money back into the country, and these are real things, the only way, they can't carry cash of so many. You have to explain a lot of big money if you bring it into Nigeria or any other country. So they will order goods from wherever. They import them into the country. They clear them. But the good is not what they're interested in. They're not interested in the profit. They just want to recover the money that they're converting back. So they will flood the market and sell at nonsense price so they can recover their money back. If you are wise and you understand the basis of your pricing, you will wait them out. Or you buy it up from them. You look for money, you buy up their stock, add it to your own, and take the price back to normal. Do you understand what I'm saying? So don't always, it is the reason why it's dangerous to just follow the market. Because there's so many things about the market you don't necessarily understand. If somebody imports goods and is selling at a ridiculous price, and you're wondering, this man is mad. He's truly mad, but find out the reason for his madness. Most of the time, they're real, they're hidden, hidden agenda. It's the same as the women who don't need to make profit from their shops. So they don't care whether they sell one item in a month or they sell it two. You can't follow them. You have to put your own price at a level that you're selling quickly and you can turn around and turn over so you can pay the rent of your shop. Ignite from dreams to reality. What do I like? I like what I do. I like going on holiday with my family. And I like my car. I like gadgets. And I like my bank. If your bank were us, you would like us too. Since 1894, we have built a strong and stable financial institution based on insightful local know-how, global reach, and a commitment to deliver to you world-class innovative solutions. First Bank, truly the first. Ignite from dreams to reality.
My name is Tolu Eros, full name Tolu Lokmai Eru Babu. I'm the founder and executive chef of Cookie Jar Premium Gourmet Cookies. Cookie Jar is a gourmet bakery that specializes in the production of freshly baked cookies every day. Um, we bake all sorts of cookies, ranging from flat-based cookies to, three, um, to cookie cakes, to cookie pops, all sorts of cookies. Starting the business itself was a challenge because um, cookies is something that I have never really done before. Um, I, have no I had no experience in um, cookie baking or production. So um, to think that I could execute a premium bakery here in Nigeria um, from the get-go was a challenge. The first batch I, I, I baked, I must tell you, was disgraceful. Um, they, they literally were, I put 12 cookies on a pan and all of them blended into one flat base cookie. And I, it was nice tasting, but it didn't look like what I was trying to Second, third try, I finally got it right and I invited a few people to try it out. A friend of mine, Sadna, was actually my first client who came by and tried out the cookies for the first time and the second time. And the third time, he said, come, are you selling these cookies or are they for free? And I said, yeah, I'm selling them 1,000 naira pack. What's a pack? Five. And that's how I actually started selling cookies. I started doing research and seeing how people outside Nigeria were packaging cookies. People were putting in tins, people were putting in, in boxes, and I thought, okay, I would start by putting in wrappers. So I went to the market with my mom, we got a roll of wrapping paper, and we came back and we started cutting out paper and, and um, patch, cutting, out, cutting out the wrapping paper and parchment paper, stacking the cookies and putting in a wrap. From that, we grew into putting it into a little white box, and from the white box, we grew into putting them into custom-made boxes that actually have content written on there. In terms of challenges, I found it very difficult to, to get access to raw materials. Um, but luckily, I was able to work very closely with uh, the supermarket, Lepisiri. And so what they do is I give them a list of items I want, and they bring those items in. Our cost of operation itself is is reasonably higher than it should be. But we have grown steadily over the last few months such that we have been able to break even. Um, and on a monthly basis, we are setting aside funds to cover our, our fixed cost. Um, we have been able to overcome a lot of the challenges we face. I have a wonderful team of young, um, upward mobile um, individuals who are striving to make sure that Cookie Jar is, is going, is surpassing the norm. What we aim to do is put that extra level of, of taste, of sweetness into your day. Now, um, as the months proceed, we're looking to move into a larger factory where we'll be able to take advantage of economies of scale. Now, um, on a monthly basis, as a matter of fact, on a weekly basis, I get a sales report which shows our, our revenue against our expenses. And we are being, we are generating more than we are spending, which means that even as at where we are right now, we're doing pretty all right. The moment we move out of here into a larger space and take advantages of economies of scale, I guess, like they say, the sky is the limit. Ignite from dreams to reality. Questions to Claire. I run a music company. Presently, I have resellers' rights for some music accessories like drumstick, but I have a specific issue with my pricing. Why did I say so? I bring in a particular product directly from the manufacturer at US, and um, their direct competitor globally has not given any resellers' rights for any of the sellers in Nigeria here. But because they are more um, they are stronger. The Alaba guys went ahead and found the way of, um, you know, imitating the direct competitor and then sell them at a much lower price. So by the time I ordered for my own products and brought them into the market, it was difficult for me to sell at a higher volume at my own pricing because the customers actually did not know that the products they were buying from them at a much lower price was an imitation of the original product, which was a direct competitor with the product I sell. In that kind of situation, how do I undo my pricing issue or how do I solve this challenge? Thank you. 
But you, you know that that's a situation that the customer will speak. You know, part of how you evaluate your business is sustainability over time, is to understand the environment of the competition in which you're in. The world has changed so much, and we've got to be... So don't say, this is my business, or this is my business model, if you see that everything around it is going to make it non-existent in a short while. Do you understand what I'm saying? How do you want to compete in such a situation? There's no differentiation in terms of the product. But the ones that the Alaba uh, boys have copied, does it do the job? Not as well as the genuine one. No, let, let, you will understand where I'm going. Not as well, but it does it. Now, the majority of the market is comfortable with the Alaba price. A large percentage, yes. That's recently. Before now, they were comfortable with yours. Yes. But once the Alaba boys introduced their own, it changed the market. Now, that means something has changed. Now, what is left of the market? Is it enough to sustain your business? Yes, but it's... not to take it to the next level. Okay. Which means that you must start working on another strategy. Because if it's not enough to take it to another level, what else can you do with the product that will now separate your own from the Alaba ones and create additional value for the customer for them to be willing to pay the higher price? That's what you've got to be thinking about. And one of the best ways, work with your manufacturers, telling them the condition of your market. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you get them to think, tell them, look, this is the challenge in the market. Now, don't forget that once you introduce that one and you, you will have that advantage for only for a season. Because the same people that went to copy that one will eventually copy that. But that's why business is progressive. Before they copy that, change the game again. The point is, we are generally comfortable. I'm doing something, we expect to do it for the next 10 years. It's a different world. The business environment has changed. It will never be the same. Technology has totally changed the world, and you have to face that reality. If you have any advantage over a product, max two years. That's the honest truth. Somebody is going to copy it. It's, that's the Chinese stock in trade. But how do you separate yours from theirs? You must begin to think about the value add, the differentiation, the proposition to the customer, whether it's the customer service, the after sales, the replacement, the warranty. Alaba will never give you warranty. If you walk out of the shop now and you turn back at the door, that's it. Do you understand? But you can go back and say to them, look, when I sell to you, I guarantee you that my product will stay with you for two years at least. And if it breaks, I will replace. People say, eh, you will replace? Are you sure? Say, I will sign a paper. Why would you be able to sign that paper? Because you already know that the quality of your product is different and therefore you can defend it. You must make that quality a selling point, but by making a commitment. And that commitment is what will eventually get your market to think about paying you the extra, because maybe in the last one year of using the Alaba one, they bought the same drumsticks 10 times. Do you understand? Which is probably the case. But they're not going to think that yours is different until you offer them something that is different. So make that the market... Buy BioStick, because with BioStick, I offer you warranty. If it breaks, I replace it. And if it breaks three times, replace it three times to establish that track record. You might lose money in the first instance doing it. That's the truth. So don't say you used it in the wrong way and it broke. Even if they were wrong, you give them. Because you must establish that credibility to trade on it. That's important. That's how you change the game. I'm into a service-based business, which is a corporate and uh, personal branding. Okay. Now, uh, I've been in this industry for about seven years. I've been worked with other people, and there's something I have seen that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who are in the service industry, maybe photographers or hairdressers or makeup artists, will also face. There are times when you are actually, the, the, the value of the service you are offering to the client is actually better than a so-called expert in the same field. Mm -hmm. 
But because you are a newcomer, you are a young person, you are an untested quality, most times they want to use pricing to push you out of the market. I mean the, cons the customer now, not your competition. Mm -hmm. You come and say, okay, fine. Maybe haven't uh, factored in your own expertise, your cost of transportation and so many other things. And then you say, okay, fine. My service cost 100,000 Naira per session. And then this person from uh, who said he has worked at uh, Arrods or wherever comes and says, okay, fine. His own service is 1.5 million Naira. Now, fine. To the consumer... 100,000 and 1.5 million is a huge gap. But they still go with the person who says 1.5 million Naira, who, at the end of the day, might not offer them the same kind of service that you would offer them. But in some cases, because of the prestige attached to them getting service from that person, how do you compete in such a market? You know, I said something about being realistic about your goals and also having a good sense of the market. Now, you, you used one word. You said people will go with the Harrods or whatever brand because of the prestige of it. So as a newcomer to the market, the guys who are chasing the prestige, they're not your target because they're a different market. They know they're paying more, but they can afford it, so they don't care. They'd rather get that service and get the pleasure of saying they're being served. It's perception. Perception has a price. And they're willing to pay. So your strategy, don't start with those ones. Go after the periphery market that wants the same service and can't afford the 1.5. So naturally, you eliminate that competition. Prove your worth and your service to the ones who, even for price, even if it's only for price that they want to deal with you. The important thing is you're getting a market break and you get to prove you can do it. When you prove you can do it, this man that cannot afford more than 100,000 and chooses you over the Harrods man might be the one that in his office tomorrow is responsible for making a decision concerning the same service. And he remembers that, and the Harrods man has sent in a proposal, and his colleagues are contacting the guy says, Dude, guys, don't let's waste time here. There's a young man that this exactly this for me. And he did an excellent job. And I know that it will cost us much less. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And you go to the man, you say, Oga, I can't do it at the 100,000 I did it for you. Because, you know, with your company, there are a lot of other things involved because I want to deliver cause, uh, service, whatever. So the price is a little higher. But he knows that that's your price that's a little higher. It's nothing. Close to 1.5 million. So you get a break into the company because you serviced him personally and you delivered. And you, you must accept your level. Listen, the fact that you are small now does not mean that you will be small forever. But I'm a Christian and the Bible says to me, do not despise the days of humble beginnings. Accept who you are Play, maximize the environment of your immediate opportunity. Build credibility there. Ride on it to move to the next level and the next level and the next level. Part of your usefulness is a lot of young people don't align themselves to that. They start a business today and they think how much, what, this some mega company is charging. So they want to charge close to it. After all, no. You put yourself at a disadvantage because there's a reason those people can charge that. Just start where you are and start to build up. They will eventually pay you more than that if you are committed to your goals. All right? Ignite from dreams to reality.